Welcome to episode 99 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. This episode is part of my series, Dad Talk, and I've invited Tyler Yonka to have a chat. Now, what's this series about? Glad you asked. I'm inviting everyday dads on the show to talk about what's important to them. Episodes may range from a little bit of Liberty Talk to a whole lot or even none at all. This series is about raising the voices of dads and listening to what they have to say. That means you may hear some dads discuss ideas that you disagree with. That's okay. Their voice is important and you cannot raise the voice of another if you spend time shutting them down. In this episode, Tyler talks about raising his children to be leaders, also known today as criminals, or at least thought criminals. Let's dive in and hear what he has to say. All right, Tyler, thank you for joining me for another episode of Dad Talk with DL here. And today we're going to be talking about raising leaders that might end up actually being criminals, but not in the way that you think. So let's get right into it. Tyler, introduce yourself and tell us who you are. Uh, thanks for having me, DL. I really Abs- appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm an, uh, a family law attorney uh, in California. I'm 50 years old. I have four kids. I have a blended family. So two for okay. me, two for my wife. And um, I'm a libertarian kind of guy. That's probably how we got connected. Mm-hmm. Um, so the family law and the dad part um, kind of play together uh, as well as the libertarian uh, aspects. And we can get into all of that, but that's that's who I am. Sure, sure. So let's let's dive right into it. How does so so you do family law and you said that the the libertarian part com- plays a role? Did I get that right? Or the- I, yeah, I think so. Um, just as far as like my own parenting, I had a I was on a so I have my own podcast as well. It's called mm-hmm. Libertarian Podcast Review. <clears throat> I review libertarian podcasts, and you'll probably be part of that at some point to hear in, mm-hmm. in, in a few days. Uh, and um, I've been a guest on another guy's podcast and he was asking me, you know, as a, as a libertarian, how does that affect you as far as a father goes? And which was, I thought was a great question. And um, it, for me, my wife's very much the same way, both liberty minded. We try to raise our kids in that mindset. And that's kind of where uh, the topic actually came about, where I used to say I was raising leaders. Mm-hmm. But, and now the way that the world has changed, I actually sometimes believe I'm raising criminals. Right. <laughs> it's not. It's it's not so much of how I'm raising them, other than those leaders that you know, forethought and and you know, independent minded children are uh, probably going to be end up uh, thought criminals at some point. Right. So, family law. I I, yeah. I think I I think I've I don't know a lot about family law. I don't know a lot about Good. law to begin. Uh, right. Right. Um, <laughs> but. Um, Give me the lowdown from a libertarian perspective, because uh, well, first of all, let's back up. Let's set, let's set the stage a little bit. How about that? Yeah. Uh, when you say you're a libertarian, um, kind of define what that means, because there's all kind of flavors of libertarian. Right. Uh, you know, like a lot of people say, well, I'm an anarchist, or I'm a minarchist, I'm a voluntarist, and I know that there's some technicalities on you know libertarians versus anarchists, and but for simplicity, let's just kind of set the stage a little bit before we get into that next question. Yeah, of course. And and I always think it's great to see kind of uh, how, where someone sits before they're, you're going to find out where they stand on something. So right. uh, where that is, um, I grew up pretty much right wing, you know, family, very conservative. And then I got into libertarian space. I've always had that kind of, kind of mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went from being just interested in libertarian parties to a full on uh, ANCAP. Okay. <laughs> you know, gotcha. Six month period. And for me, it was all about just finally uh, that realization that um, each side has. And, and by the way, your question is great because just last night I have a 17 year old daughter mm-hmm. and my, my wife and I were talking to her about some other things. And my wife's like, hey, explain to it because I'm going to the Libertarian Convention for California this weekend. She's like, okay, why don't you tell her what a libertarian is? And so you have to kind of dumb it down. Yeah, my kids aren't dumb, but mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's someone who just isn't really interested in politics right. and explaining it to them. So uh, my version is the ANCAP, you know, that uh, government doesn't have any rights. And basically it's, you know, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. The non-aggression principle mixed with uh, property mm-hmm. rights. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and and it sounds terrible to say, oh, we're going to dumb it down. But I think another way to look at that same phrase is to, is to remember <clears throat> as so my my trade is development, like software development, programming. Okay. And I used to be a web developer. And when I was just coming into web development and I was still learning, I, re- I remember a senior web developer one time told me, he said, 
a lot of developers, when they get seasoned and they get to a certain point, they forget what it's like to be new and not know everything that they know. Yeah. And I think libertarians notoriously suffer from that. They forget what it's like to not know anything like about libertarianism, right? And it's just, and so they, they kind of go really, really quickly and start talking and using all these terms. And I'm like, you're confusing the heck out of people or they'll use phrases, um, kind of get, you know, so yeah, I think it's a good idea to sometimes just kind of lay it out simple. You don't right. hurt people, don't steal their stuff. Don't, don't, steal, uh, don't steal their stuff. And then follow the non-aggression principle, which effectively is, I cannot aggress against you unless you have first aggressed against me. Right. Right. So super duper simple. So when it comes to family law, and the reason that I was kind of curious about that, it seems to me family law generally, at least in the minds of most people, means divorce. Right. Right. Like at least that's a large part of it from the lay person's view. And so those are usually pretty nasty. And so I'm just curious how you can navigate those waters as a as a libertarian and and walk away feeling like, yep, I did the right thing here. Because sometimes it seems to get so nasty that I'm like, I don't know that I could do it. Like, I'm not sure. I don't know how. I mean, you know, so enlighten <laughs> me, if you will. Well, I'd never said I walk away feeling. <laughs> OK, OK, fair enough. Uh, no, but um, th that's a great point, and uh, one reason I, mean, I got into family law kind of in, a, in a, a roundabout way, it just happened that that's kind of what I was working at when I first started, and then it was better to be good at one thing instead of bad at a whole bunch of things, so I'm right. really concentrated on that. But uh, I had a law partner, I had my own firm, but uh, one of my early law partners, uh, he had started in criminal law, and so he's fighting against uh, the state constantly mm -hmm. and he just got so and you know, i it would help him with some of those things and i'm like i don't want anything to do with that anymore that's right that's a system that is broken and i don't want that so at least family law it's just two you know private attorneys for the most part mm -hmm. fighting against each other the state is only involved as far as the uh, the, mm -hmm. the judge goes because just all bench trials sure. so as far as that part goes um it, you're, you're better off and now one of the things you can always do it's not like you're a public defender or you're the da and you just take the cases kind of as they come I could decide not to take a case. You know, okay. a person comes in and they, they, I had this and some of the best decisions I think I've ever made are not to take a case. Someone okay. comes in and they're completely crazy or they want something that we just can't see eye to eye on about how are we gonna go through it. And my biggest problem or task, I think in a lot of this, and actually, and you make a great point about dumbing things down. I'm constantly, you know, you bring in a new client, you constantly have to explain the situation to them. Mm -hmm. And part of that is to make sure you're not talking above them so that they mm -hmm. understand that and to set their expectations. And so with that, it's client control. And mm -hmm. so some of those best choices I've made are to not take people. So a lot of that you can end up um, kind of getting, uh, in a sense, like-minded clients, you know, as mm -hmm. long as I don't even advertise anymore. It's just all, you know, word of mouth. So I'm not feeling like I'm, I'm desperate to get clientele in. Sure. So someone comes in, I have a client intake and, you know, things don't work out. Um, they don't work out. And then, um, you know, you hope you make the right, <laughs> the right decision on that. Right. Yeah. So were you a libertarian before you got into law or did that happen after? I've always been, as I told you, I was uh, more conservative, but I was always very libertarian minded. Okay. So I just, I just was kind of um, naive, I think, as to the way the world works, even though I'm you know, older, uh, but read Bastiat, knew of Mises and stuff. And, and it wasn't until I became an attorney late in my life. I, I went to, uh, I was an engineer, first of all, and then went back to law school. And so it's been, what, 12 years or so. And uh, right around that time, I was starting to make the break with the liberty mm. with uh, and, and into the Libertarian Party. So both of those have kind of moved together. What's interesting, though, is, you know, you go back and I think of these some of these arguments I had in law school and um, with some of my lefty friends. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would totally change my, my mind on some of those things at this time. So right. uh, that would be interesting. Yeah, because, you know, it, from what you were saying, like, you know, ha having to break things down to your clients and explain it in a, you know, in a very simple way and not lofty, it seems to me that that would be good training for yeah. communicating the ideas of libertarianism to yeah. the wider world. And right. it's, it's one of my frustrations with libertarians is that I, I, you know, I constantly am griping, you know, I'll see somebody post like a picture of all the new books that they just received, you know, they've got their little spread of books out and they're all libertarian philosophy. 
And I'm like, well, where's your books on communication and you know, in, right. you know, engaging with people mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Because it's great to know all this philosophy and to work it out. And a lot of times, I feel like there's a lot of time spent on like the nuances of society that we're simply not ready to have a conversation about. Yeah, you know. And I'm like, I mean, we, I'm sure you could, you and you and I would agree. It sounds like that there are plenty of conversations to be had that aren't really where libertarians want to be, but they're the conversations that we got to start with, with people. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I just find that, you know, I, I, maybe we should all go and be lawyers. I don't know. <laughs> no, don't, uh, uh, not nothing. I mean, I'm sure people could be great lawyers, but, uh, you know, th there's a joke out there. I think one of my law professors said, he's like, you know, it's a, it's a 99% of you that all make a bad name for the 1% of us. So. Okay. Fair enough. So you're part of the 1%. He's talking about attorneys. Well, of the okay. of attorneys. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I'm I'm glad to be talking to the one percent. So that's really. I'm, cool. I, yeah, I'm not. Yes, I'm. I'm not. I'm a uh, and and that's more of an ethical type of thing sure. too, right? And which is interesting, you know. Um, it, you're confronted with all kinds. You know, law, lawyers uh, have a bad name for all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and my biggest, uh, I think, asset or the, the you have in in my business at least is. Uh, your reputation and your name, and I'm not going to throw my. And, and you know, being an attorney is an is a great uh, asset for my family. I could go out there and I can make you know little money, or I can make a lot of money because right. you're not really constricted to you know just the the especially someone that has their own firm. Uh, but with that, I'm not going to throw away uh, something for just you know five thousand uh, dollar fraud here and there of just mm -hmm. cheating a client or something like that. So um, at least for me, I have morals. I <laughs> have uh, those kind of things that help me out. Right. Gotcha. That, well, that's neat. And and how does how does and I don't mean to make this like just a whole bunch of questions. So feel free to just that's fine. Ask me a question, whatever the case sure. may be. Um, you know, if, if I can answer it, I'll I'll do my best. Um, because I, I don't want it to be like twenty questions here necessarily. Right. But I'm curious how um how being a lawyer has kind of played a role in being a dad. Because this is this right. is dad talk, right? Yeah. Um. So so, and I feel like. I feel like every profession, even if it doesn't seem that way out uh, from the outset, does play a role in being a dad in some way. So I'm yes. curious how, because I'm not a lawyer, right? I, I, right? I do, I write code for a living. So, you know, I basically tell a computer what to do and then get mad and cuss when it doesn't <laughs> do what I tell it to do, which is clearly not the kind of behavior that a dad right. should do. Right. So, um, <laughs> But so, so how is, how has it impacted you, especially since you're dealing with families and a lot of times the families are, are, you, you know, they're going through trial and tribulation and I imagine, you know, nobody wants that to happen. Um, and especially somebody who sees it over and over. I mean, it's gotta be taxing, right. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it can be. And, you know, you've got to, uh, one of the earliest things I, I kind of taught myself was. Um, in a way to disassociate yourself from um, kind of the case itself. So mm -hmm. if you take on a case and you're almost defending it as if it's your own child, that everything is, you know, you're going to be way too emotionally involved mm. and you're going to have difficult making your arguments. So I'm much better. Matter of fact, just as kind of a side note, and I'll, I'll get into this, I had a traffic ticket several years ago and uh, to a hearing on it and my uh, law uh, partner at the time took care of that for me. And the, so I hate to say this, but the the uh, officer there was there was completely lying, and I was very frustrated about this. And I finally realized what my clients are going through, sitting there, right, mm. having to hear this. Um, so, how does this play a part as far as being a dad? Well, I think um, you're exactly right. Um, we can't, you know, you're, you've got a computer background I, as an engineer. I've kind of got that same kind of mindset. You can't program your family. But what I've had to do is I'm making decisions and advice for people all the time. And I, I remember thinking about this when I first started doing. It, I'm like. Um, are you making those same advice and life decisions in your own life? You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're getting paid a lot of money to tell these people, you know, what the best solution is. And then you go home and I have an ex-wife, you know, and I'm sharing custody with kids and am I making those same decisions with her? Right. Uh, and so for me, I really had to kind of think about that. And as far as a father go, um, you know, it's fine. You're, and, and it almost was a, a way of, in my own mind, of thinking like, oh, you can handle this. This is, because you know, sometimes your, your personal life is so much more overwhelming because it's, once again, it's like the, the, the case where you're in court yourself and you're overwhelmed with the emotion. So 
Um, for me, it's it's done that. It's it's given me a chance to show my kids that um, I could be, you know, make decisions and be the man of the house. My mm -hmm. my my wife, I'm, I'm remarried, been ten years, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know she likes that kind of man. And I have two daughters, two sons, and they like to see uh, someone that is in charge and mm -hmm. makes decisions that are fair. And uh, so, I think anybody can do those things in their lives, depending on what their job is, and they can bring those kind of decision making skills home. Um, another thing that has done for me too, is just, I've realized that, um, you can accomplish anything. Now, this is just me personally. I mean, mm -hmm. um, building a chicken coop for my wife, as an example, you know, you go on uh, YouTube and you do these right. things and, 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 and once again, it's just an idea of, I can be my own boss at, in my job and I could come home and I could put forth the same kind of mentality and do things and show the kids that you can just, you know, make a, a make something. And my 21 year old, my oldest, he's in college. He just started, he bought a truck. He started re overhauling the engine and he's, you know, YouTubing these things up. And I'm very right. proud of that kind of like, I taught him that you can just figure it out because I can't figure out cars. So <laughs> good for him. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And, and it's one of the things that I'm trying to teach my son. He's three. So, you know, I- Congratulations. Th just, th thank you. There's not a whole lot to really teach him like in the line, like, you know, not compared to like, say, a 16 or 17 year old, right? Right. And, um, but I'm trying to slowly bring him about to this idea that he can do a lot for his own self. And, you know, I, I definitely look forward to the day where he's like, dad, I want to do this thing that he doesn't know how to do. And yeah. then, and that I don't know how to do. And then I'm like, all right. Sounds like it's going to be a journey, buddy. We're going to go figure it out. <laughs> right. Um, right. You know, and, and then maybe we look up YouTube or maybe by that time there's, you know, some other medium right. under which we will find that same information. But, you know, that's how I grew up. Like my mom, it's funny, like I saw something on Twitter the other day. They were like, who taught you how to change a tire or something like that? And I was like, my mom. And and it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't that my dad wasn't there. He was he was there and he was a great he was a great man for sure. He just wasn't interested in. Uh, like tools and stuff like that. Like he didn't have this mechanical drive to do things like that, right? But uh, he had other things that he bestowed upon me. And, but it was my mom who, who showed me how to, to basically, I guess, learn, if you will. Yeah. Because I, I grew up watching her. And if she wanted to learn something, she just went out and figured it out. And this was before YouTube, of course, right? So like this, she had the library, she would come home with like stacks of books, and Damn. she would read about stuff. And um, she taught herself uh, how to sew, she was like an expert steamstress. And I remember she would make these like giant, like bigger than me, I'm five foot three, 120 pounds, but bigger than me, plush, uh, stuffed animals, like bears and dogs and stuff like that. And then she worked at like, Joanne Fabrics or Hancock Fabrics or right. one of those places. And they would sell them for her and she would make them. And then she would, she made all of her Halloween costumes growing up and she made very elaborate ones. So we're not talking about like she grabbed poster board and some stencils and some, some markers. Like, no, like she made one year, she made one of us a penny and she literally <laughs> sewed in. So you, you had like Abraham, you know, Lincoln or what, you know, and, and all yeah. the, text and words and everything and so she literally s sewed that in you know so you could see it um into the fabric right and how old um, are you i'm 43 okay so we're not we're not too far off you're, you're like my wife's age uh, which is uh you look back and uh the sewing right the ability to mm -hmm. sew i think has kind of been lost my my mm -hmm. mom did that my sisters did that uh my mother-in-law mm -hmm. does that and so she kind of taught one of my daughters to do and, and um you know it, it's, I think with uh, the ease of just repurchasing and throwing something yeah. away, we just lost that ability. Right. So is yeah, your mom, I, is your mom still around? She's not. She passed away okay. back in 2016. Um, okay. Unfortunately, breast cancer came back and, um, and had its way. So that was very unfortunate. But, yeah. But I, but I remember just learning. I, I, I learned the biggest thing that I learned from my mom is to learn, which yeah. is kind of weird because it didn't feel that way because I don't think she did it intentionally. But she learned how to sew. She learned how to play the piano. She learned how to fix like pretty much anything in the house. So like now I'm getting into tools and building things. And I, I built this like fence outside. And I was like really proud of my fence. I built the yeah. gate from scratch. 
I, and, I did the same thing and, yeah. and I know the pride, the pride. Yeah. It sounds stupid, but yeah. Oh yeah. And it, what was funny about this fence, it's only five sections, right? So it's kind of like when you look at it, you're like, well, it's only five sections, buddy. Well, but did you have to, you know, uh, do concrete to, for the posts? Right. Right. But I did. Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's huge. But here's, here's what really got me. So I went and I bought panels. Okay. okay. And it's starting to sound like not much, but I bought panels and the panels that I bought were the shadow box where you have like one board here and then one board on the other yeah. side alternating. Uh -huh. Right. And, um, I bought them and then they had the rails would stick out about two inches on either side. And I was like, Oh, I will mount these in the center of the post. Well, it turns out those, uh, that style is not meant to be mounted in the center of a post. It is meant to be mounted on the outside. Uh -huh. And I and I was being extremely stubborn, and I said no. I want these to be on the inside because I know I don't. I, I mean, it's it's my neighbor, but I'm like I want it to look good on both sides. Right, right. I want it to look even. Like you look at it from one side, it's the same as when you look at it on the other side. So I happened to have a router, an old router, very old router, and I I had never used it, never used a router in my life. Watched some YouTube videos, and I started routing, doing um, mortise and tenon, basically writing a hole so I could slide it right in there. Right. Right. Burnt up the router, which I'm like, hey, dear, looks like I got to buy a new router and I'm going to get this new one, this new nice one. And I did. Right. And so it was great. So then I finished up the project and it looks fabulous. And so, yeah, a, I, just on that. So um, a flashback to uh, we, we have a decent amount of property. We're like, kind of in the city, but like uh, about a half an acre. It's a huge mm -hmm. lot. And um, when COVID first hit, I courts are closed. I do family mm -hmm. law. So I'm not working. I'm just working at, at home, kind of doing some things. My wife is on, she always works from home. So she's there. And I make the comment of vacation, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> and she looked and she was livid because this is not a vacation. So I decided I had to do something. We have chickens. I built this amazing chicken coop. When right. I built that, it's the, 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 the pride you feel from this. And then what's yeah. cascaded off, I built a major workbench. Mm -hmm. I just keep doing it. I've redone yep. our floors in our bathroom. And what you're just talking, first of all, men out there, um, I encourage you to try these things. Like you said, you can find yeah. them on YouTube. The tools you can buy are amazing. Oh, I, yeah. I spent, you know, a, a minimal amount for new flooring and stuff in our bathroom, but I spent twice as much on new, <laughs> on new tools, a bunch of saws. That's the fun part. But it's, right. it's an amazing thing that you can get. My dad was a mechanic. He was a we deal with his hands all the time and he would just take it from me and just do it. That's just how he was. Right. Uh, so I didn't always learn unless I was interested. But I mean, men can build a lot of pride and you can mm -hmm. teach your kids just like your mom was doing for you. Um, and it's kind of my kids are doing it now. My son wanted to build some wiffle ball thing and mm -hmm. I'm like, figure it out. I'll yep. help you all go buy the stuff. And he had to go yep. and, and do it. And there's a lot of pride that you can just minimal. And what that does to you as a man mm -hmm. is pretty amazing because oh, yeah. it then um, allows you to kind of uh, reflect that onto your kids. Your wife, my wife has never been more excited than, <laughs> than the chicken coop. Right. I, I don't understand her, but. Right. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. And like right now he's three, so he's, you know, he's got a ways to go, but he'll start taking some of like his blocks or yeah. something and he'll start putting them together to make a house. House is usually the easiest thing for him. And, um, he's got these like magnetic toys and he tries to put them together. And sometimes they, because they're magnets, they kind of do their own thing in a way because the magnet gets close and kind of does kind of the opposite of what he's aiming for. And it'll maybe collapse or do this other thing. And so he gets a little frustrated sometimes and he gets upset. And so I understand that like, hey, right now, like it's, you, you know, there's there's a lot that he needs to learn about just everything in general. Right. Um, but if I can, you know, sometimes I'll sit down, I'm like, look, dude, we, we you know, like little buddy, we can figure this out. Like we're going to figure this out. Right. And we're going to, and like him and I actually spent like an hour. He wanted to build a dinosaur. He's loving, he loves dinosaurs <laughs> right now. He wanted to build a dinosaur on, from the package of this, this, um, plastic magnet kit and so i'm like ah, that looks like it'll be easy we'll do that so we're sitting at the counter turns out i guess it's meant to be made like on the face of the counter not standing up oh, gotcha. yeah because it kept like we started getting to the top and it would start collapsing every single time so we were trying to you know you know and he and so i was like all right this is my this is my chance to show you how this works like yes sometimes daddy gets mad throws something and cusses and carries on but usually <laughs> he he works it out right and like that's what you got to do and because i want him to feel that pride of whatever it is that he builds in the future or whatever it is he does yeah. 
And I think that's, well, I have, I, I don't know how you feel, but I feel like one of the ways that parents impart, uh, uh, it, I'm trying to think how to say it. One of the ways that you build up your child is to impart on them the confidence that they can do something. Exactly. And because when they get older, then they don't feel like anything is off limits. It's just a matter of what effort level do I need to put into this and am I willing to do it, right? Um, like I'll give you reading, for example. I remember I mentored a kid and he didn't like reading. And I think I, I, think I discovered after, you know, a long time after thinking about it for a long time that his challenge was that he hadn't kept pace with his reading skill. So the things that were interesting to gotcha. read at his age were a little difficult to read, whereas the, the skill level that he had was below his age, but that material wasn't interesting. So it kind of became a bit of a problem because he might want to read otherwise, even if it only a little bit, but he, but he had trouble. And I, and I don't want my son to ever feel like something is, you know, like off limits. And so like to this day... I, there's exactly one book that I can name that I'm like, man, that's a tough book. And I had trouble going through that book, but, but everything else, everything else I've ever picked up, I'm just like, all right, this one's a little complicated. Going to have to slow it down a little bit. Right. And, and it's just, you know, and I, and I feel like I can, I can accomplish anything if I really want to. Um, it's just the really want to part. <laughs> no, no, play. completely. Um, I, I, as an example, um, I, I could point to my degrees. Mm -hmm. I, I went to, I got a degree in engineering. I went to grad school for that. Uh, I got a law degree and I was never, I mean, school was fine with me. I wasn't, I'm not one of these brilliant people, mm -hmm. but you, you know, you, I worked hard right. and you can get through it. And, and I remember in law school, um, you know, people would say, oh, they're, the class we got to take next year. And I know the guy in that class and it's so tough. Mm -hmm. And you'd start to freak out. And then you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know politicians that are attorneys. They, they're they idiots. Right. They made it through this. <laughs> I'm like, everything is always, you know, and so I try to impart that to my kids as well, right? right? Of like, hey, don't listen to the naysayers. Mm -hmm. um, you can do this. It just right. it might take a lot of work. Or maybe mm -hmm. you're really talented or, or may, maybe this is, isn't the thing for you right. either. Uh, what was the book that you uh, had difficulty with? Um, let me think of the name of it. It's uh, It's something about a golden braid. I can probably... Um, it was written by a physicist. Uh, I bet I can. By the way, that it. while you're looking that up, uh, your comment just reminded me earlier about libertarians and all their books and stuff. Um, what's what was for me when I found I'd always, like I said, known some libertarian stuff, but it was always really boring and whatnot. And then I found Dave Smith, and he started talking about this Rothbard stuff. And when mm -hmm. I found that. It was exciting, right? It's um, and it's it's maybe like like anything else, like a relationship, or when you get into religion or something, where you know the initial thing is exciting, and um, you can't just do the dumbed down version. At some point, you have to get more and more and more mm -hmm. in depth, and I think that's what happens with a lot of the libertarians, where they get excited about something and they go down the rabbit hole, and it's exciting to them, and they want to have more of a community, and they want to talk about it more, and they're they talk to their family or their spouse or their their mom or whomever, and um, no one's interested. So right. then they get in the, in the groundswell of the libertarian uh, underworld, which is uh, could be a cesspool for arguments and stuff. Oh, I don't know what yeah. that had to do with anything, but uh, I hope it took some time while you looked at right. it. Right. No, it, it you, good job buying me a little bit of time there. <laughs> I did find it, by the way. It's called, uh, and I think I'm pronouncing this name correctly, Godel Escher Bach, an internal, uh, an eternal golden braid. And oh. it's written by Douglas Hofstetter. And, you know, I would love to tell you what the book's about, but I got through the first chapter and I was kind of overwhelmed. And I was <laughs> like, and, and what made it difficult, what made it difficult for me was I didn't have a sense of where the book was going. And maybe I was just being a little bit immature at the time. Maybe if I, because I, I still have the book. So maybe I, you know, I go pull it out and I kind of read a little bit more slowly, maybe check out some reviews or something like that. And then get a little sense of where it's going, because one of my one of my failures, I guess, you know, if you want to call it a failure, is that if I don't know where like the conversation is going or where some media is going, I quickly lose interest. And so yeah. I've got to have like if you're talking to me and I'm like, okay, but where are we going? What are you talking about? What, what what's the gist that we're getting toward at least, so I can start putting everything into context? Then I have a little bit trouble 
being interested. And I think that may be mostly what was at play. Um, but it's been a long time. So, I mean, it's probably been four or five years since I tried to read the book. So what's, what's, what's interesting, I just uh, had some thoughts here about books and not finishing them. And I have a real problem with that. And I think it's the mindset of, for me growing up of like, Hey, you finish your whole meal, you don't know, mm -hmm. leave food on the plate. And I think right. that's that mentality had led to obesity <laughs> as far as a lot of people right. in America. Cause then they started to have, you know, uh, certain restaurants that would just have a ginormous right. servings and you've got this mindset of not, you know, it's not good to finish it or whatever right. uh, books. I have the same problem. So uh, it's good that you're able to somewhat turn that off. And I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, I remember the first book, this, uh, brother or cousin's husband sent to me and, then, um, I decided not to finish. It was one of the first books I decided just to put it down. It was horrible. It was all in like uh, this person's mind. The, mm -hmm. the whole book was written like that, so it was like almost third person the whole way. It was. It was. I don't remember the name. It was just bad. Right. <laughs> Put a book down if it's not good. Don't waste right. your time, people. That's kind of the, uh, the right. Device. And 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 it's it's. I think it's better to say. You know what? <clears throat> I don't think that right now this is a good use of my time. Yeah. I, I would rather my son do that for whatever it is. Like if he starts a project and he starts realizing like. Hey, right now, um, may maybe there's a lot that he has to learn in order to be able to do it, uh, you know, to complete the project. And he might say, I don't really have the time to invest right now. I'm going to have to put this on hold or something like that. That's fine. Like, you know, to make a conscious decision and say, okay, for whatever reason, it's not, you know, I, I need to move on. It's another thing to feel like he can't. Yeah. Right. And, yep. and, and I don't think that my issue, like with that book was that I can't, but even if it was, it's like, it's like the first and only book that I can ever think of. Like, and I've, we've got between my wife and I, we've probably got two, 250, 300 books, something like that. We, we got quite a few books in this house and they range all over the place. So it's not like we're nerds in one particular area. We just like, if something looks interesting, I'm like, oh, well, I'll get that and check it out. And so we've got economics and i don't think we have any law books but we have uh <laughs> economics science math uh social books you know social topics uh language I mean, I, all kind of stuff and i wouldn't necessarily recommend any law books uh scalia um mm -hmm. who's dead now he did write a book about um, persuading being a persuasive speaker is kind of like what you mm -hmm. talked about before um, and I remember him, him talking about there about uh, lawyers do have a tendency to overdraft and, and write too much. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what's kind of to deviate here a little bit for family law, you do a lot of these little 15, 20 minute hearings, you file paperwork for that. And um, I'm always, you know, some clients want a lot of, you know, details in there. And I'm like, the judge is barely going to be able to read any of this. You're going to be best to be uh, have brevity. Right. And be more succinct. Right. And anyway, that was uh, one thing that um, Scalia had mentioned in his book about right. communication. As is I that, talk it, on, didn't he? Is, is that I think he wrote a book about like how to convince. I don't know that it was the title. Yeah, yeah. I think it was how to like con that. how to convince a judge or something like that. Yeah. Or ba basically, how to con how to present a convincing argument to a judge. I think it was the gist of it. Was that the book? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Because I saw that since I read it. Yeah. I saw that and I was like, hmm. I, I've always liked reading some of Scalia's stuff. He was he's very interesting um, to read. And it's funny that you look online and you see all the things that people say about him and then you read his stuff and you're like, there's a huge disconnect. Oh, of course. Um, you know, I mean, you still, I mean, people can still disagree with him and that's fine. But, um, I think people like, I think it shows a bit of failure in our society, hopefully one that I will not impart onto my son, which is to to go and spend a little time to at least know in as much as you can about a person before you have things to say about them. Um, and it's one of the things I actually do in the Libertarian Party and I'm really notorious for, I'm like, have you met somebody? Have you, have you sat down? Have you eyeball right. to eyeball talked with them? Because yeah. if you haven't, you probably shouldn't be using whatever insult that you're using right about now, you know? And, and I get in a lot of trouble for that because people don't like hearing that. And I'm like, I've met a lot of people in the Libertarian Party, uh, and, and people in general. But in the Libertarian Party, it's very you know we're very notorious for giving people labels. And right. uh, but I've met a lot of people, and they uh, they're not the caricature that uh, that was presented to me uh, almost ever. 
Well, um, the, the eyeball, the eyeball is a huge thing. I mean, and just the, the ability to, you know, get on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, and to, to rip into someone is super easy. And right. then, you know, Dave Smith, I'm sure everyone knows who it is. He talks right. about, you know, having Twitter wars and then he goes to an event and everyone's just, it's different. You know, it's right. like anybody, you meet him in, in real life. And, uh, and, and by the way, you know, it's real easy to have a nuanced fight over something. But right. uh, the reality is you get to meet you, see someone eye to eye and have a lot more in common. Right. Um, but, you know, Twitter and Zoom, uh, what we're doing here is right. enabling us to still communicate, which you and I would not have been able to do before. So. Right. So I don't, I'm sorry, I don't mean to tell you, talk about all my stories. That's crazy talk. Well, I can I do like that it. on my I own like time. Uh, so I really want to get into um, how your kids are going to be criminals. Because <laughs> um, we want to get this on record. Just no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right, right. But uh, no, in what ways do you like? Because I have my <clears throat> my my uh, my thoughts. What ways do you think that the things that you're teaching your kids might put them as criminals? And I assume you mean criminals in the actual literal term, not just kind of like loosely used. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think mostly of my uh, so two kids of mine, two of my wife's. Now my my wife's kid, two kids are. Um, fully ours or their dad's not in the picture. And so we have, I'll just go through the ages real quick. So the oldest mine is 21. Mm -hmm. Then um, the next one is 18. She's almost 19 Then 17 and 15. So college, college, gotcha. uh, junior and sophomore. Okay. Right. So we have the idea boy at the top, boy at the bottom, two girls in the middle. My girl, that's the second from, uh, she's just a junior. She is uh, amazing, and, and they're all amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say that out there, sure, but she's sure. different. She is uh, very abrasive, speaks her mind, great at sports, super smart, intelligent, good looking, this whole little thing, mm -hmm. and she gets in trouble at school. Mm -hmm. And But her grades are supreme. So this whole last two years with the COVID problems, you know, in California, wearing masks in the school, she goes to a private school, and they're still enforcing these things. I can't side with the school Mm -hmm. for anything, almost anything. If she gets in trouble and they come to me, which they do, I'm like, um, any normal time I would be filing a lawsuit against you for harassment and the way you're neglect, you know, the, the mm -hmm. way you're treating my child in school with making her wear a mask and some of these other things. So I don't want to, I can't side with you. And so I'm, I'm maybe a little bit over bombastic on this, but I do, my daughter is, I, I try to show them to be skeptical and not cynical. You know, mm -hmm. you talked about your, okay. your kids yep. growing up and question things. I think that's the biggest thing I've done for them. Because when I grew up and I went through all these things and my parents were very much in line with the idea that, you know, the teacher is the authority, which mm -hmm. is fine. But right. when you get out in the real world, I remember having an argument with my dad, uh, smart guy, um, very, you know, you're, you're no nonsense, typical, mm -hmm. uh, he's a mechanic kind of guy. Um, and I was taking a, a engineering class. It was environmental engineering. And I was having a discussion about some micro, you know, beetle in the Northwest and how it was, you know, ecosystem, this and that. And he had just rational views on the, on the economy, uh, the environment. Mm -hmm. And I was taking a more um, massaged view that I was being pushed from my professors. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, years back, I look at it and I was like, oh, my dad was totally completely right. But I was taking, my teachers are telling me, and they're the, this guy's a professor, he's an engineer, he's much right. smarter than my dad. Right, right. And, and now I try to tell my kids that you don't be disrespectful to teachers, but they are not the be all end all. They right. are not the extreme authority. And I don't want to need to get into uh, statistics that Thomas Sowell and Walter E. Williams have done about teachers and the, the low end that they, I'm getting into it, right. low end that they are for actually um, uh, of college graduates, right? So right. you're not necessarily always getting the best and the brightest. Right. Point is on this, um, as I've developed my kids and teaching them to be skeptical, to ask questions, to always push back and to use the word because a lot when they're doing little arguments, I believe this because, and then you've got to rationalize it and ask the teachers to, to justify what they're teaching them as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's really broken down to them. They've seen it. The scales are peeling off of their eyes. My kids have conversations with me about this uh, and they're realizing that the teachers just can't necessarily answer this and they're just right. regurgitating things. So when I say that I'm creating criminals, I'm creating leaders, but our world has changed where right. leaders can't have those thoughts anymore. And right. leaders are not uh, having the ability to be uh, mindful. And, you know, everything that we're going out there in the world here, you know, with wokeness is creating the leaders to be, I, I'm saying criminals as kind of joke, uh, 
but um, no, I'm not so hyperbolic about it. I think that's right. that's kind of the way we're it's going about too. I mean, if nothing else, thought criminals, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank Be, you. Because at the end of the day, um, we're we're kind of creating this society where questioning things is unacceptable. Right. And for me, I, I grew up watching my mom learn everything. So my mom never went to college. In fact, she didn't even graduate high school. Gotcha. She dropped out of high school and got her GED with her sister because they had a bad home life and so they ran away. And but then I watched her learn things. So I watched her learn how to, you know, she could work on a car. Like she could and I don't mean like she could go out there and fill up the air and the tires. I mean she could like, you know, change the oil, she could change belts, she could change an alternator, like, you know, like things that many guys, if we're being kind of, you know, all right. of the sexes can't do yeah. right she learned how to play the piano uh she would play like the entertainer and she would play like uh who is it scott, scott joplin. joplin by the yeah, way scott joplin yeah oh yeah that's that's who wrote the entertainer but she and, and she got like she modified the piano so she could play uh ragtime like like she really got into it she learned it and was she gonna go and play at carnegie hall no but if you came over and heard her play you'd be like wow you've had quite a few lessons Right. And she just she learned how to do all these things. So in my mind, you just learn how to do a lot of stuff, you know, and yeah. um, and, and so the idea that I have to submit all of my learning, all of my thoughts and everything to, you know, to whatever's out there rather than exploring it, you know, because to for me, I guess, let me kind of let me kind of add this in there. I think of exploring how to do something not much different than exploring an idea. Yeah. It's really the same thing. Um, you know, and, and, and let me interrupt you real quick, yeah, but I want yeah. you to continue because that is, um, I, I think, the distinction that intellectuals don't necessarily understand. You've got someone out there that with their hands, a mechanic that some, um, you know, professor of psychology or whatever, um, he's, you know, super or her, you know, they're smart, they can do whatever, and they have an idea, and that's how they develop it. But there's someone out there with their hands that are doing things that these people could never understand. And, right. and you know, that should be um, acknowledged. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Oh, yeah, you. absolutely. And, and, and I think there's, I think there's an overlap if you do the, the infamous Venn diagram, right? Like there's an overlap for people that are autodidacts in the, in, in areas where they're using their hands, and then maybe where they're in areas where they're just, they're just learning ideas and concepts and, 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 and terms and, you know, stuff like that. You know, I think there's an overlap there. And so I want him to be able to explore anything because one of the things that I feel very proud about when I graduated high school, I joined the military because I didn't really have any direction. Okay. And then eventually I was like, ah, this is not for me. And I was still conservative at that time. So it wasn't like some, you know, revelation for libertarianism. I just said, you know, I don't think this is, this is not the direction that I want to go in. So then How I left. did you serve? Um, I was in the National Guard for seven years. Uh, okay. I would have been six years, but I signed up for a little bit extra so that I could go and do a tour in Bosnia. Okay. And uh, after the war. So there was, you know, not much going on there. Gotcha. But, um, but so, I, so I, I, I get out and then I'm still kind of exploring. Right. So I get a job. I, I get a job working at Rena Center and then I get jobs working in the food industry. Right. And I'm just kind of doing all these things. And eventually I got a job working in a at a fastener company, just like kind of like in the partly in the warehouse, partly in the office. So just your typical like paper shuffler going out and maybe filling some orders. Right. And then that led to because I like to explore things. That led to an opera, you know, because I would explore things. I learned how to use like Excel and do some, you know, interesting things in there. And then I was, I was able to start taking information with, from the company and start, you know, kind of doing different things with it. And so that led to an opportunity where I became like what, what they, they called it program manager, but it was basically like, um, try, uh, like inventory management. And so my job was to manage inventory from the time that I got to our dock to the time that the customer put it onto their product. And these were like fasteners, sort of like nuts, and bolts, screws, stuff like that. And so I did that for a long time, which then led me to doing software uh, or technically web development. I didn't really do software like you might install, but uh, coding, you know, more, more yeah. programming related. 
and I started associating with people in Charlotte. So like, you know, you can see that. So I never went to college. I don't have, I, I have like an associates that I barely got because I was a terrible student. But this willingness to explore just kept me, you know, leading me to, to look at new things and try new things. And then I also have that when it comes to ideas. So I once upon a time was an evangelical. Uh, no hard feelings toward any evangelicals whatsoever. <laughs> I just, I, like, I personally moved away from that, right? I also moved away from being a, a very conservative Republican. And, um, you know, and I so, and, and it was just through this slow progression of just thinking of ideas and challenging my own ideas, right? And yeah. so I, I want that for him because I'm 43 and at no time, have I ever really felt like, gee, I would love to do that, but I just can't. <laughs> right. I feel I'll feel like I have failed as a dad if if he ever believes that, you know, like, you know, within reason, of course. I mean, if he's like 90 and he's like, oh, I'm not going to be an astronaut. Well, probably at that point, no. But, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, you know, within reason, like if he's like, hey, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I want to do it. There's a path somewhere. I just need to find it. Forge it if I have to. Yeah, totally. And uh, just kind of on the evangelical thing. So something that um, my wife, when I met her, uh, so I'm, I'm a Christian. I've been, you know, growing up in that all my life. Uh, I feel confident with that. Um, my wife was kind of not really, but she's, um, I, I don't know if I've converted her. She converted me to libertarianism. I mm -hmm. brought her over to the Christian side. But one thing that she made a comment to me when she was first getting in this, and I think it's important for everybody, whether they take the mantle of, uh, you know, some sort of religion or not, is there's something that's high, and, and I think this is important for kids and growing up once we're, in, we're talking about this, is there's something higher than them, and I mm -hmm. mean, like, above them, right. like, um, for me, it's religion, it's God, which means right. my God is not my state, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what that does for the child and, and even adults growing up is that there's some, something's more important, you're not the right. be-all, end-all. Right. And stop thinking of yourself like that. So as a religious person, we think of it more, a little more that way. It helps with that context, mm -hmm. kind of keeps me focused. But um, I think libertarians, in a sense, have that. They just, because, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be a void. If you don't have God, or you don't have whatever, you're going to have some sort of, you're going to put your mind to something. Right. And I don't know what that is for other people. But for me, it's, you know, it's, it's what it is. But I think libertarians tend to have that because they don't gravitate towards, you know, the left or the right as sort of a religious aspect, which is, once again, the problem that the thought crimes, you mm -hmm. know, it's, you start to divvy everything down to a religious aspect. So kind of the question to you, what is, um, I mean, do you, do you agree with that? And um, then what are you doing for, for your kid to kind of um, manifest that? Um, so unlike many people who have left the church, it seems like I am not hostile to the church. I just happen to decide that, uh, you, you know, I have it. I take a different view of scripture now. And so my wife is Catholic, though, very devout. Oh, so she goes yeah. every week. And we even got married in the Catholic Church over in Indonesia because she's from Indonesia. And um, lately I've been kind of slacking because, you so know. So she, she just guilt you into doing what well, you Well, no, no. We're, we're actually – we're we're insanely independent, and people might almost think that we're we're barely a couple sometimes. But oh. um, initially, I made the decision. I said, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to church on Sundays, even though I'm not particularly a fan, and I, and I never was a fan of the Catholic Church just because I felt like it was boring. Yeah. Um, just to be honest. And uh, so, I'm not Catholic. Uh, oh, whew, good. Uh, it doesn't so, matter anyway. Right. So I, uh, but I was like, you know, I have this thing. I feel like any anyone in any kind of leadership capacity, whether you're the chair of an affiliate, whether you're a business leader, whether you're a, a dad or a mom, whatever the case may be, you should not ask somebody to do something that you're unwilling to do. <coughs> and so I was like, you know, to set a good example, I'm going to start taking my son, you know, I'm going to take the family to church and I'm going to go with them. She doesn't require me to go to church and she's like, oh, you don't have to. And for a long time, I actually was, uh, I was going and uh, taking him with me or, you know, it, it, you know, I'm taking the family, I guess. And I mean, my wife obviously doesn't need my assistance to go, but, you know, our son kind of needs a little bit of direction and guidance and whatnot. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to go. Lately, I've been kind of slacking off partly because of the weather, because, you know, I become a bit of a hibernation creature in the winter. And <laughs> e even though I'm in Northeast Florida, 
like 50 degrees feels <clears throat> like pretty cold winter to me. So, uh, but I've actually been thinking about it lately. I'm like, man, I need to get back into that because, you know, I just, I, I need to, I need to do that. But then teach him to explore and just like, what do you think of that idea? And try to keep my perspective out of it in as much as I can so that he has an opportunity to explore it first. Yeah. Uh, there are some tenants that I think are, are good to, to kind of put down right away, you know, like, hey, don't hit people that haven't hit you. Right. Like, like, I, I don't really need him to explore that one. Um, but basically, te you know, teach him to explore because when he grows up, maybe he'll decide he wants to be a Catholic. Maybe he'll say, you know what, Dad, I think evangelicalism is the path for me. Maybe he'll decide that he's a Buddhist or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. I want him to explore. And I think that goes hand in hand with talking about raising leaders who might end up being thought criminals. Right. Because. <laughs> One of the things that leaders tend to do is to, you know, look out at the landscape and make a decision for themselves based on what they're seeing. Yeah. And so, for instance, with COVID, one of the things that really just got me furious was all the reports coming out. And they were like, you know, don't do research on your own. And I was like, no, no, this, this is terrible advice. Like, I get it. Lots of people do very bad research. Because a lot of people go out and they just look for something that agrees with them, right? So I get that. But the answer is to teach people how to do better research, not to tell them stop doing it. And I don't want my son. I'm, I want my son, if there's a pandemic when he gets older, I want him to say, start questioning things and say, let me go look at the, you know, let me read a study. I read, I've read a few studies, um, I, you know, and I read, you, you might appreciate this. I, uh, on, on some of my other podcast episodes, I, especially the older ones where I was just going solo, I would actually do what I call a bill review where I would literally just take a bill. It might be a local one, a state one, a national one. And I would just read it. If it was shorter, I would read the whole thing. If yeah. it was longer, I might find the, the parts that are in question in the media and then kind of read a, a portion of it, um, just depending on the size. Uh, and then I would just talk about it from a lay perspective, like I, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what, you know, I don't, who knows, I could be talking out my butthole here, but I'm going to talk about it and give my impression of it. And I, and I want my son to be able to, to do that, you know, when he sees something and to question it, you know, like whether it's a bill or a new study or some idea, just whatever, just question things and see if you agree with it. And, you know, so religion as well. Uh, and on and that was great to, to hear actually um what, what's interesting too you're talking about this uh so i i have a myriad background one one of the things i did for many years of my life was uh, I, I raced bicycles i was a professional cyclist at one about five mm -hmm. years uh, i still do that um not professionally but you know at an amateur level <clears throat> right. point is i'm only reading that because uh training and fitness you know the olympics are going on right now each person is so different the way that their, their body reacts to different diets, different training right. regimes. Not not everything works the same, right? Mm -hmm. So when they're talking about don't research for this, we have one guy in our nation that's telling everyone how they should uh, basically handle their health. Mm -hmm. This is not how health works. This is not how fitness works. This right. is you just don't do that. You consult with your own doctor. You do a lot of right. your own research, and um, you know I it it doesn't make sense uh, right. to us. So I, I, I feel your frustration there. Specifically. Oh yeah. And you know, it's funny that people will like, I'll see some people uh, just going on that, you know, health and diet. Like a lot of people say, well, well you need to lift weights. I agree. L lifting weights is a great thing, but you know, sometimes it's not for everybody depending on what it is. So for instance, um, you can't see it cause I got my head headset on and all that, but I actually have a scar on the right side of my head where I actually had what's called a middle fossa craniotomy. And it's because I had a, an inner ear problem that had oh, wow. to be operated on. And the challenge that I have is that I have to be careful about the um, the air pressure that's in, in my head, particularly in my ear. So like lifting weights, when you're exerting energy, you you get some of that pressure up into your um, up yeah. into your neck and your head. And I have to be very, very careful about doing that. So even lifting like... Not, I mean, not like 400 pounds heavy, but just relatively heavy where I'm kind of straining a little bit. Um, I have to be very mindful of that. Um, I, I'm not even supposed to go scuba diving ever. 
I, I could imagine. Yeah, the air you pressure. Know? What about planes? Or is it? I mean, they obviously I, pressurize them, but yeah, uh, I, I can go on. I, yeah, airplanes are fine. Uh, the problem with the scuba diving is that. Um, so, so what it is is there's a, a small piece of bone that's actually in between the brain and the ear, uh, the inner ear. And for some people, it actually get, thins out as they get older. And then mm -hmm. like a bump on the head can actually break it. And then they have this constellation of, uh, of weird effects, right? And our uh, symptoms. And so I actually have had mine probably since my early teens, if not earlier. And I finally realized that there was something like I, I it just took many, many years to even realize there was actually a problem here. And so he actually had basically went in and I, I say he spackled it like it was you know, drywall. Um, because right. he, he took he took some paste and he mixed it with some of the bone that he cut in, not to get too graphic here. And then he basically made cement that he put in there and covered over it, right? And so the, the challenge for me is if if I'm not careful, it could break if I go if if I'm not careful with the, the air pressure in my head. So it could actually break. And if I'm underwater and it breaks, then I may um, because it's my vestibular system, I could actually lose my sense of direction and what and, and, and be quite clearly not know which way is up. And that wouldn't be good if you're you're obviously diving. Right, right. What what you think about with your uh, your problem? And then, by the way, was that genetic or was that something that happened that you? Uh... Not sure, unfortunately. Okay. Maybe got um, beat around as a kid. And, it's it's um... it's it's usually something that happens after us. So as far as I know, it's not really a birth defect. Okay. But, um, but I'm I'm not really sure. Oh, yeah. Um, I had a point and now it slipped my I'm mind. Sorry. Which was... <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> no, that's fine. But, and, and, and that's a bit of an edge case, right? So that's a little, right. a little on the unfair. I, I, but I know what I was people... going to say. So in, in, in the way the world we live in right now, since you have a problem that could kill you, we are supposed to do everything we can to make sure that we don't interfere with your, it's not for you to look out for yourself anymore, right? That's kind of right. the society we live in. I'm making jokes about COVID sure. stuff here, right. obviously. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of the peanut allergy, um, we've got to make sure that no, and, and that may be a little extreme too, but no one should be scuba diving because therefore, you know, you're, you're going to be put in, uh, in risk. So right. it's just a weird world we live in. Right. And, and I, you know, I feel like as a libertarian, one of the things that, that people seem to misunderstand, and maybe it's how we're communicating it, right. Is that it's not that we want to go to this free for all society. Yeah. You know, it's just like, Hey, each person needs to be responsible for their own self. And other people need not get in their way, right? And um, but that doesn't mean that we can't look out for each other. That doesn't mean that we can't do things like, okay, taking the peanut allergy. If you know if your kids are going to a private school, I don't mind if the private school says, "Hey, you know what? We've got two or three kids here, and um, you know that that are alert that are seriously allergic to peanuts and we know how kids are they trade their lunches all the time right. you know so we want to be careful that we don't cause a problem that you know that will freak out a parent and potentially put a child in danger probably should have reversed that but and um so they might just say we're not going to do peanuts but then again other schools might say well we don't have anybody we've asked all the parents specifically and nobody here has a known peanut allergy, so we're good. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead, you know. And I, and I feel like that's the that's the way we get a better society, yeah. where we're 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 still looking out for each other in a way, you know. But we're we're doing it in a way that doesn't limit everybody for the few, and that, and that's I, I what I feel like we're doing. I have a <clears throat> good friend of mine, uh, very much in line with us with me politically, and you know, doing, going through this whole thing. And they have a daughter; she's a freshman. She's got an extreme peanut allergy, and their whole point this whole time is we teach her to be, you know, worried mm -hmm. about this peanut allergy. She knows how to. You don't don't live your life right according to my daughter. This is right. something that, that she has has going. So, uh, you know, and and look, um, the world we live in for for libertarians. Um, having the, the different markets that can that can create different schools and everything like that's a wonderful uh, right. opportunity that we have that um I, I don't know i don't know what to say about it other than it feels like we, it should be happening more but it's not right and i and i i think it's an opportunity for us as a liber as, as the libertarian you know part of the libertarian community to say all right we're going to go out we're going to show everybody we're going to we're going to learn how to communicate the 
the greatness of the markets and the greatness of our ideas. And I, and I think we fall a little bit short in that area, probably a lot short if you're, if yeah. I'm being honest and, you know, and, and hopefully whatever shortcomings that I have, I will, when I'm, when I'm raising my son, he won't have those. I mean, he'll have his own, but hopefully they won't be mine. Right. Hopefully he'll yeah. work out those and he'll be, you know, hopefully he'll be a libertarian who knows. Um, but Assuming he will be, hopefully he will be a great communicator, way better than I ever thought about being. And, you know, he will be able to to easily talk to people like we were talking about earlier at the very beginning, breaking it down and making it really, really simple. Right. And I, and I think that's very important. So um, uh, one more one, one yeah, more thing here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You just made had me think about which was and I had this uh, thought and I uh, accentuated it uh, when I was a conservative, which is, uh, you know, you ever. Uh, through the years, you've seen the news reports, you know, tax returns of the, you know, the people that are running for uh, president, as an example. Mm -hmm. And you would see before, you know, the, the Bush, as an example, was, uh, you know, millions of dollars he would give away to charity uh, when it was taxes. And then it's like Gore, that was like two or three hundred dollars. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So my my thought even at the time was you're seeing a breakdown of social services. It's all put on the government. That's very much heavy that the left right. understands that that's the way it is. So, you know, churches, Salvation Army, these kind of services have mm -hmm. really gone away. And if you look back at Rothbard uh, for a New Liberty, it might have been even been, he talks about, you know, different solutions, market solutions. And one of them he, he talks about was, I think, the, the Mormon church at the time, you know, some of the the, the social um, uh, aspects of the, that they had to take care of community and how it was mm -hmm. arranged. And we are getting way away from that. So you yes. talk about kind of these aspects, everyone's idea, you know, comes about, you have COVID, well, you get a stimulus check rather than going out and getting help from your community. It right. doesn't have to be religious, but you know, the religious ones are maybe the only ones that are, or they're all going away now. But um, right. that used to be such a big part of our community that you didn't rely in. And, and I think it's, you felt more of an obligation to take care of people that way because you can right. see exactly where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's so much easier. It just gets taken out of your paycheck. Right. And then, you know, they're the guy in the street. But yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And I, you know, I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but it reminded me of if you, if you watch me on Twitter every so often, I'll see like a video um, like at a high school where some, you know, kid is bullying another kid. And then I'll see the other kids laughing and nobody intervening. Right. And, it just right. and, and now, now I got mm. picked on when I was a kid because I was a tiny little guy. And then eventually I grew out of that to the point where I was a little bit more brazen. And then I got to the point where I was like, I'm stepping in. And, you know, like I wasn't really getting picked on, but I might see somebody else getting picked on and I would step in. And, and to guys that were like, you know, twice my size sometimes, right? I was stepping up to them. Uh, hoping that I wasn't making a huge mistake. And uh, so right, right. I, I look at this and I, I'm like, I, I just feel like, and, and maybe I'm seeing it more. I can't decide whether I'm seeing it more or whether we're losing it, but it just feels like people are, um, they're pushing off this, I don't want to say responsibility. I, I don't think it's an appropriate word, but for lack of a better word, they're pushing off this responsibility to intervene and help out people that are you know maybe being picked on bullied whatever and and i know there's a certain amount that goes along with being a kid so I, i'm not saying that like every teenager i don't have this idea that every teenager should be you know not bullying in the moment they see one they all jump in and say no no that like that would be great but i know better um but it just feels like i'm seeing more and more like just not people inter you know people not intervening and i'm like i want my son to intervene in some way, like step in and just like, look, knock that off. Like, this is not acceptable, you know? And it, and I don't know, I just, it, if, you know, it feels like if somebody's cars broke down on the road, you know, you can expect them, you know, it's, it's a gamble whether they're going to get help. I mean, by a, yeah. a passer buyer, I yeah. mean, not, not by, you know, AAA or the right. police who might stop and, and give them some help. I mean, by just a regular passer buyer. And I feel like we're, we're, we're moving further and further away from this. You know, where we're really kind of insulating ourselves with our own communities and and like to hell with everybody else. I want I, 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 I you should be congratulated for uh, saying what you just said, partly because I've made similar comments and I know uh, top lobster on I had a communication with him that he had 
on a podcast that said something very similar, which kind of goes back to, um, you know, the bullying aspect that, you know, mm-hmm. big thing in school. Uh, so what the solution now is that you call a teacher, a teacher right. resolves everything for you, right? Your, your kids are not looking to intervene and to right. solve these problems themselves. Right. Now you go into the workforce, mm-hmm. they're used to teacher. Now it's the boss handles everything they, they, I'm not telling people to have confrontations, right? I'm telling them your neighbor is doing something, you know, you, whatever, you'd go over there and you have a conversation with them right. instead of calling the cops. Right. You know, I just saw on um, a news story, I think it was Reason had had it, where um, some mom had to go to work during oh, COVID. Yeah. The four yeah. children? So, yeah. So yeah. The, the three-year-old or whatever went to the neighbor's house and they called the cops. Mm-hmm. Well, that neighbor could easily, because the, the story says that son had done this earlier, you know whose house it is. Right. Just what was his go. friend's house? They said he went to his friend's house to play right. with his friend. I don't yeah. like some friend's mom. Right. So point is though that, that parent, you know, you don't look at the kids. I look at the family that he went to and the cop and right. say, what's wrong with you? Right. You know, let's resolve these things yeah. as normal people do. And by the way, that's where I'm teach, trying to, that's the biggest part of my, my kids is to uh, give them some leeway, give them mm-hmm. trust. I always tell my kids, I, I, I'm not, I'm going to be more upset at the reaction of you doing the wrong thing than just telling me up front what you're going to do. And so Mike, right. I have great communication. Kids right. tell me what they're doing. Right. Um, and I trust them, you know, a much, much more than you would uh, expect. And, and, you know, I have the free range type of kids too. So, right. um, it, it goes along with what, uh, good insight only because I agree completely. Right. And I've said it before. Yeah. I posted that same article on Facebook gotcha. and I was like, I was like, dear friends, if I see your kid, uh, doing something that I don't believe they should be doing, whatever it is. I was like, I will contact you first. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, I will give them a popsicle and send them on their way. I, you know, this summer I was I got up early to to watch a bike race, probably the Tour de France or something. Mm-hmm. Also, it's six o'clock and the doorbell rings and it's a neighbor kid, and he's like, "My dad's gone." And I'm like, "Well, his dad's probably going running." So I just he hung out with me for a while. His dad comes home. You know, I didn't call the cops in, right. or CPS. So. Right. Yeah, it's just so crazy. I'm like. Uh, you know, like I mean, if a if a parent's beating their child in broad daylight right. with a stick, and yeah, sure, okay, I get you on that one. But like, if the kid wanders off, like really, kids wander off, like that, like <laughs> right. is, how? What kind of a surprise is that? Like yeah. every four year old is trying to wander off at all times. That's their is, task, is why, yeah, right. Like that's their goal in life to see if they can get away. So yeah, it's, it was just so frustrating. So hopefully, hopefully we, uh, it sounds like you're already on the right path because yours are, you said between 15 and 21. So, yeah. so they're, they're basically there. So, it, and it sounds like, you know, their trajectory is already pretty well set and solid. So kudos to that. And hopefully in the next 12 years, I'll look back and I'll, you know, I'll look and I'll say, yep, my son, he's on the right path. And, you know, I can expect some great things from him. I'm sure so, you will. And, you know, I, I just, thoughts coming through my head. You had talked about it, but your path in life, just a quick comment. Mm-hmm. Isn't it interesting how, you know, I've got kids getting ready to pick their careers and you talked right. about kind of moving through, you know, at 18, they're going to go to college and pick what they're going to do for the rest of your time. That's, right. that's rough. And so, you know, um, I don't force my kids into, you've got to go to college like dad, um, right. well, my son, because he wants to be a nurse and you can't really <laughs> do right. that right. without, sure. you're not going to put catheters in uh, some roadside uh, truck stop. Best right. practice. So, you know, depending on what they do, um, you know, that's not always necessary. And, um, you know, you said you didn't finish, but it, that should not diminish anybody. I'm trying to remember who it was, a Georgetown professor, maybe Tyler Cowan or one of these guys wrote a mm-hmm. book about um, education. And his point was you could go through engineering school. Let's say you got all but the last quarter and you didn't right. get your degree. And then someone goes through in some humanities class. That humanities person is going to be thought of more because they got a degree and then this guy that just had one or two classes, or girl that had right. one or two classes left, and that's a tragedy. Yeah, I'm I'm looking up a quote because I I always like to get it right, and I never remember it. And let me see if I can grab it here real quick because I think you'll appreciate it. Um, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the the quote. It's from Daniel Dennett, um, an American philosopher. And let's see if I'm skimming here, see if I can't find it really quick before we close out. Um, uh, I know. There it is. So he describes himself as a, quote, an autodidact or more properly the beneficiary of hundreds of hours of informal tutorials on all the fields that interest me 
from some of the world's leading scientists. Mm. That's his quote. Now he's he's actually a learned learned person, right? So he's got formal education, but he also describes himself as just somebody that likes to learn and he learns from other people's work. And I'm like, that's exactly what we should be doing, you know, like, so uh, ho hopefully my son will, will do that. And um, it's, it's good to hear that your children are already doing that. So yeah, I Tyler, hope your son's a, a criminal along with my kids. <laughs> I, I, you know, Hey, I, I think he will be, I, I think uh, he's definitely, so today he, he threw down today. He threw down like serious, like <laughs> you said three years old. Yeah. He's three years old and he, he is like 98% of the time. He's like super happy, cheery. And he woke up, came downstairs and I was like, Hey bud, how's it going? And he just like started crying and wailing and ran off and went over to console him. And he was like, you know, kicking me away. And I was like, all right, let's give you a few moments. And then mama tried to do it and he still wasn't having it. And then he went into terror mode and he's just like trying to throw stuff and grab stuff. And I'm like, all right, look, we got to get you contained, buddy. Like, so it was, I, it was rough. You know, they say, that, they say, yeah, you know, they say that the, the terrible twos, but my, my remembrance is the three was worse because two, they're just, they're, they're babbling, they're whatever. Right. And then they freak out three. You're having in one moment, you're having a normal conversation. And suddenly the next, they're throwing a temper tantrum. You're like, wait, we just, we just had <laughs> what happened? I, I, yeah, it's what happened, and it's a it's a crazy time. But uh, God bless you, uh, and yeah, all the best for that. Yeah, it's I, it's, it's, it's awesome. Rough. Kids are wonderful, actually. Oh yeah, he's no. I I mean I, I I'm not lamenting. Of course, no, no. I so get for it, anybody yeah. watching, I, I totally love my son. He's awesome, and I. In as much as you can know before being a parent, I knew that I, these kind of times were going to come. I just didn't know what the experience was going to be like. Right. And right. now I'm finding out what it's like. And yeah. it's a challenge sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I'm texting my aunt and I'm like, was I a terror like this? Do I need to tell my mom sorry <laughs> up in heaven? Like, I'm so sorry, Bob. Luckily, so, you, yeah, as the older you get, you, you lose memory of like, you know, I, maybe you're not that kind of person. Uh, for me, you know, I get done with something and... I think of like how I'm going to do it better the next time rather than the pain and the suffering that you go right. through because your mind is kind of, you know, like that. Uh, so, you know, the older you get, the, yeah. the better memories, you just kind of forget about all those times they, oh, they yeah. decided not to wear a diaper and shit all over the place. And Yep, you know. yep, yep, yeah. We have... <laughs> Had that this morning. He didn't. He was wearing his diaper this morning, but we 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 did have a bit of a mess to clean up earlier this morning. Like right away in the morning, I'm like trying to do breakfast, and I'm like, all right. <laughs> I'm asking my wife. I'm like, all right, will you take over on the eggs? I got to go and take care of this. Yeah, <laughs> fun times, that's, man. That's awesome. Fun times. So, hey, it was great having you on. Any final words that you got? Uh, no, I just I, only last thing I'll say, and I I have this from Family Law, which is I see the mistakes dads make uh, all the time. Um, especially if they're single dads, if you're, if you're in there with, you know, the best thing is to have a great relationship with your partner, uh, to be there for your family and especially your kids, they need it. If you're a single dad, the best thing I can tell you to do is to think about that kid in a different way that your wife has only always done, which is, you know, schedule things. Uh, the best thing I did when I became single was to get the iPhone at the time, uh, mm -hmm. and, and start every, put everything on a calendar. Men just okay. don't think in that kind of aspect, right? right? They go to work, they come home, the wife's got everything going. And now suddenly they're a single dad. They've got to do that. And they're not thinking of those things. Think of your kid. Um, it takes just a little bit of time, just plan it out, just get a little bit of organization for them. And you will end up being more time for your kid because you're just, you're, you're just thinking it in a different way. You just got to Sadly to right. say, think like a woman. In a, in right. Something. No, I hear you. So listen to Tyler now so you don't have to listen to him later. Right, right. Because later could be bad. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button and connect with me at Liberty Dad on Facebook, Liberty Dad Pod on Twitter, or send me an email to libertydadpodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. To catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode airs Monday night at 8 p.m. And while you're there, be sure to check out the other free speech media shows. Prefer an audio format? Then head on over to libertydad.com or just search for Liberty Dad, all one word, on your favorite podcast app. Remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.